Good morning, good morning, Sean here with Accelerators Organization. Time for another mentor session. So real quick, I wanna say, those of you that do see this on a replay, which most of you will, anytime you're thinking about something that's going on in your business, there must be a better way to do this. I wonder how to do this. What would Sean do? Most won't I will. What would the successful person do? Log into the portal, make sure it's right there on your phone on your desktop to be able to just get in and out really quick. But remember, think about the question that you're asking. And the way that I like to do it is I like to write out the description of the question in the background first, and then after I get all the stuff out of my head, then I think about what is the real question that I'm looking to have answered, and then I type in the question. So try that, okay? Let's get to today's mentor session. You know, I wonder if I'm actually in the Facebook group or if I'm on my personal account, I can't remember. I'm hoping I'm in the Facebook group. Okay, first question comes from Gabriel. And Gabriel says, looking for advice and tips on introducing, onboarding, and training an upper leadership position that is being hired as a completely stranger coming in from the outside with the company. The background is I've always been huge on promotion within the company, but for the first time, I feel that there is no one in the business truly capable of filling the higher leadership position that needs filling. This would be the highest position reporting directly to the business owner, me. This person has been working for a similar business for 10 years and seems to be a good candidate, but is a complete outsider to us and I'm able to bring them in. I'm about to bring them in to steer the entire ship. The team will need to trust them, respect them, follow their advice, etc. How do I do this most efficiently from day one of bringing them in? Okay, fantastic question, Gabriel, and I look forward to seeing you at the uh, October event where we get to meet, meet you guys. This is a very, very complex thing, bringing in as a founder, bringing on a new second-in-command type of person. Really important to, just like any position in your company, this is no different. It's very important to figure out exactly what the title is going to be and why, what the job description is, like what is it that, they, that you are hiring them for, what's the long-term thing that they are going to be doing for the company. Then put together, which is dynamic, a complete list of all of the job duties. Then you want to put together what are the job requirements. What software do they need to know? Um, what relationships they might need to be? Uh, all those types of things. Then what I like to do with that type of role is put together a minimum of a 30-day onboarding program. If, they're going to, if you're going to be extrapolating everything out of your brain and putting it into them so that they can then be your you know, your, your, your uh, operational type of person so you can focus on vision and strategy with them. It's gonna be really important for them to shadow you and for you to create a system in which they can start documenting all the processes. This way you won't have to repeat yourself when training them with all the different things that you probably do on a daily basis or a weekly basis or monthly basis. As you know, I highly recommend the software Trainual, T-R-A-I-N-U-A-L. It's about 100 bucks a month. Make sure you use the discount code AO10, number 10, in order to get a 10% discount. This software makes it really easy to document processes. I worked with Joe. Once you learn how to truly document processes using both in writing and video and audio, it will really make it that much easier for your team and your employees to succeed. And this is really important. If you can get that person and make that part of their job description and duties in the first 90 days that you wanna establish a goal of them assisting in documenting processes for the entire team across the entire company, that could be a longer term initiative which will really benefit your company. We also, as you're gonna see at the October event, understanding personality profile. It's really important for you to understand the profile as you've already gone, gone through in one of the uh, workshops you've done with us here in Nashville to really understand somebody's personality. What makes them fit? How much can they um, emotionally behavior modify in order to achieve goals? Going to be really important for you to put together a clear, concise 
in a compensation plan that includes incentives. You might even start bringing into the conversation with you and me and, and other mentors how to create some goal, what's called golden handcuffs, things that will keep that employee on with the company for an extended period of time, especially if you're going to be investing so heavily in their training and understanding of the business. We want to set up some sort of uh, carrot that you're dangling in front of them that if they stay with the company for a certain amount of time, that they get this. And there's some vesting things and all kinds of things around that, okay? But that's what I would do is really think about putting together a minimum of a 90-day plan with objectives and how to measure and track those objectives with all the software that is, they're going to utilize for the company and then put together a nice 30-day plan for them to shadow you as much as possible so they can extrapolate everything out of your brain. Okay, hope that helps. Next question comes from Corey Stevens. And Corey says, how can I overcome the fear of starting a conversation with someone? The background is I'm in network marketing and I'm looking to build relationships with people. I'm great interacting one-to-one -one with people when the conversation is flowing. But when it comes to starting a conversation with a complete stranger, I feel like something's just blocking me. I go through how the conversation will go in my head and it sounds great and when it actually comes to start the conversation, I just have a mental block and procrastinate over doing it. What are ways I can overcome this? Okay, practice. The more we practice, the better we're going to become. Think about, so Tom Black, one of your mentors in here, good friend of mine, just had dinner with him last night. One of the things that he likes to do is come up with three to four questions that he will ask almost every single new person that he talks to. Where are you from? How long you been in town? What brought you here? You know, those types of things. What do you do for a living? What got you into that? Those types of things. Always have three to four questions already roadmapped in your mind that you're going to ask every single person. And one of the things I love that Tom taught me and Tom does is he's always the first person to start asking questions. And the reason why psychologically around this is if we ask somebody questions, that means they're going to be the person doing most of the talking. We get to listen, watch, and observe what they say, how they say it, their facial features, body language, all of those what's called nonverbal communication that Tom talks about in Pro Code Sales in the portal. By asking questions, we start to listen and watch in order to steer the conversation that we wanted to go. And then after, as you've heard in Pro Code Sales, after we steer and control the conversation in the beginning, the law of reciprocity kicks in and they're going to logically ask us questions and we want to be prepared with responses and we know what we're going to say to the most commonly asked questions like where are you from what do you do for a living those types of things we want to have good answers that have been rehearsed and that's going to help take off some of the pressure to make things up as we as we network with people so try that remember practice 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 the only way to get great at something is to continually practice and know that you're going to get better and better and better over time. Okay? Hope that helps. Next question comes from Dan. And Dan says, what is the best way to learn about financial literacy and how to make sure the company is staying positive? Background is I have a cash flow anywhere from sixty-five dollars to $95,000 a month. I am tracking my projects individually to see if the project is profitable or not. When it comes to keeping track of the profit in the company, I need to know what percentages need to be for the line item on my profit statement. How much should I be spending in marketing? And at what percentage should I be spending on other aspects of the business? Fantastic question. Uh, I sent you an email today, Dan, introducing you to Tyler McBroom and his firm. This would be a great conversation to have with him as a CPA, CFO type, and bookkeeping type, and just understanding numbers. One of the things that we want to do when we're understanding our profit and loss statement is, is when understanding the profit and loss statement, there is gross uh, sales minus expenses, uh, all right? And that's going to leave us with our gross profit. And understanding your financial statement and how it works is more than just understanding it on a project by project basis because some of the expenses that you're using 
uh, are, are called shared resources. So you might be using, if you bought, let's just say an easy example, if you bought a thousand nails, right, for your company that are in your inventory, you're not using them just on one project. You might use some of the leftover from those nails for another project. So there are some expenses that are going to get utilized across different projects and how to position that on your balance sheet and within your profit and loss statement. Really important. If you work with a CFO type, like a good CPA, they're gonna be able to work with you within QuickBooks and whatever software you're using to clearly make sure that you're making the most uh, and tracking your numbers the most within the project. And then once it comes out of a per project basis inside the whole profit and loss statement for you to determine what your, your net profit is as a company. You wanna know it, of course, per project, what your profit was, but then you're gonna have expenses after that, which is gonna be maybe your compensation or internal company expenses like rent and other things that, that don't necessarily fall within each individual project, if that makes sense. Set up a conversation with Tyler, um, fantastic. You can also jump on a Zoom, one of the monthly Zooms with Jeff Bruno, who is a CFO, outsource CFO company. Once you get to about 1.5 to 2.5 million a year in annual sales, that's gonna be a good time to start really looking about looking to bring in an outsourced CFO uh, that can work with you throughout the year. Will cost you somewhere around 25 to $30,000 a year. Well worth it, you're gonna get a $150,000, $200,000 employee at, on an outsourced basis to really help you start leveraging your balance sheet and your P&L in order to grow, okay? So talk to Tyler, talk to Jeff as well, okay? Hope that helps. Okay, the next question comes from Quaid, and Quaid says, what makes more sense? Targeting one specific field, scaling, then expanding, or slowing the growth process and build systems for all targeted avenues along the way? The background is I intend to scale my company to operate across many facets of construction. I am new to scaling businesses, so your experience will be of great assistance. I am unsure whether it is smarter to learn all the avenues I wish to pursue from the start or start with a direct focus, then expand as we scale. Thanks. Extra info if needed. My thoughts are the more we keep in house, the better numbers we can pull. However, that entails more risk as I need to employ a much larger firm. Focusing has benefits of building a reputation, a reputable name in said field. However, this will cause lost time learning the other fields. I like this question, and there's no wrong or right way to do this, so I'll share with you my perspective. When I started my last company, I focused on one specific product in one specific industry. I was selling a lobby-based computer system to go into limited service hotels. Limited service hotels might be like a Hampton Inn. It's a hotel that does not have a restaurant in the, in the hotel. A full service hotel would have full food and beverage, uh, uh, and dining, a restaurant, room service, all those types of things. I decided to go after the smaller limited service hotels specifically. That gave me focus. It made me really, really expert at knowing how to talk to those specific type of hotels. Once I started to gain traction, hire some salespeople, build out my administrative and operational team, we then expanded into full service and we went pretty much world, worldwide. And so what I like to do personally, because I didn't come from money and money was an issue, I like to go after the lowest hanging fruit first and start creating positive cash flow in the business in order to start building out my team and then expanding. That's the route that I took, mostly because I didn't have access to millions and millions of dollars of capital. Now, there are a lot of companies that follow the philosophy of go wide and go and, and build. Um, I just didn't have that luxury. If you have the luxury of an unlimited budget to be able to expand and go after different markets and different areas of your business, that might be the right solution for you as well. I would certainly jump on the weekly Zooms and maybe dive a little bit deeper with Dan on the business model and operational side to share a little bit deeper of the conversation and see if he might have some additional words of wisdom. But like I said, personally, I like to go after the lowest hanging fruit, be very clear, concise, and, and laser focused, 
it's more like a rifle shot instead of a shotgun approach and really start building up my profits and cash flow in order to start building out my team, which will allow me to expand while still not eating up all my cash, making a little bit of profit and growing. Hope that helps. The next question comes from Bouchon, and Bouchon says, how exactly do I make a buyer persona for my mobile app development business? The second question is, how do I know I have created the right one? The third question is, and do locations affect personas? Like, do I need to create a different persona based on each region I'm trying to target? The background is I've been going through the materials in our AO portal and have a basic profile slash persona fields but still confused about how to make them concise for my business. A little background. I started a new mobile app development business in 2020 in India, and I've worked with two clients. Clients came through referrals. I want to have a steady flow of projects and inquiries, and I would like to target specifically and not at random. This is my first question, but from the materials in our portal, I have learned that it's better to target specifically than to target any and all. I know this might be a broad question, but any and all feedback would help. As for the clients, I've had international customers from UK and US, and they both were startups. After a while, they asked for features and changes for which they didn't have the budget for, and I lost the client and money. So I don't want to create a persona based on such customers, which would lead to similar experience again. All right, I love that question, Bouchon. And Bouchon is developing our mobile app for AO, and so far my work experience with him has been fantastic. Okay, so the first question, what makes our, um, how do I make a buyer persona? It sounds like you're already starting that. You're saying now, how do I know I created the right one and do locations affect personas? Let's go to the third question, just location affect personas. Of course, so when you're thinking about building out a buyer persona, and if you're using the document that's in the AO Resource Center under branding for buyer persona, if you go through that in detail, basically what we're trying to find out in a buyer persona is everything about what makes a prospect buy from us, like what's involved in the buying decision. And yes, that could be affected geographically because the culture of India might be different than the culture of the UK or Switzerland or, or uh, the United States or South America. It's really important to understand the culture and everything that goes into the buying decision from our potential prospects. We, we want to take in what kind of budget, what kind of customer are we looking for um, from a budget perspective. And part of our sales process, part of the discovery process, when we're first talking to a lead and trying to understand if they are a qualified prospect. So we want to, we want to, we want to actually detail in our sales and market, our sales process, how do we qualify a prospect? And one of the of course, qualifications is, is that they do have a budget or would make a budget available to purchase our services from our company. That has to be part of the discovery process in sales, right? Um, so yes, take location, everything into consideration as it relates. Now, this doesn't mean, mean that you're necessarily creating different buyer personas at this stage, Bouchon, because when you're at the stage that you're at kind of just starting, I would pick, I would pick an area, a location, a geographic area to target specifically in the very beginning. And I want to make sure that I have the internal resources to market to that specific geographic location. For instance, if you were going to target in India, would be really easy for you to know how to communicate, how to talk to them as an Indian business person, an entrepreneur, and there probably wouldn't be much of a language difference or culture difference, right? If you're targeting the United States, then it's important for you to have clear, concise dialect of English in order to be able to speak with English speaking uh, clients like you're doing with me and understand the cultural aspects of building a relationship, the negotiation, and all those types of things. The next thing is, is, is to build out the rest of the buyer profile. You know, what client, what type of clients do you wanna work for? What are their needs? And all of those things then, once you build out the buyer persona and you understand who that ideal client is, then you start trying to specify where you're gonna start building your prospecting list. 
So what kind of business is it? What kind of industry? And how do you go find those emails and phone numbers in order to start the sales process? All right. I hope that helps. Uh, very, very challenging for a small company to do these things. But knowing all of these things is going to help you start putting together that process. I think at some point, it would be really beneficial for you or, or for you to hire a salesperson or even a, a business development rep, lead generation type person and pick an industry once you know the target customer and what, what industry they're in for you to start um, building out a full sales process and possibly hiring Tom Black to help you with those processes. Tom Black, person who, you know, one of your mentors, uh, best sales coach, and he's really good at B2B sales, okay? Hope that helps. Okay, and the last question comes from Sam. And Sam says, how do I go about selling six types of earrings online? The background is, after much thought, I decided to order six different styles of earrings in bulk, and I want to sell them online using Shopify. What is the best way to go about this? I think I should focus on marketing strategies mostly, but any help is appreciated. Okay, Sam. Whew, man, you just kind of threw me for a loop with this question. You might want to network with Nancy, who um, I believe she lives in Germany. Sorry if that's not right, Nancy. Um, why don't you get with Shirley and see if Shirley can connect you with Nancy because she's a jeweler and she is building a brand around her jewelry brand and she might have some good insight for you. Here is my challenge with what you're saying, Sam, and I, and, and I think that doing this, you're going to learn a lot, but I don't know any other way to say this than to be super, super straightforward and direct. It sounds to me like you're not trying to build a brand and build a business. You're just trying to make a quick buck. Okay. I'm going to go buy something for a dollar and then I'm going to sell it for $2. Like that's all you care about. It doesn't matter if it's earrings or rubber dog shit out of Hong Kong. It doesn't really matter. You just want to find a way to build some sort of online business so that you can work from home. And that's great. Another person you might want to network with here in the group is Todd. Um, Todd, get with Shirley or get with me and let me get you an introduction to Todd because if you really want to get into the business of learning how to arbitrage like on Amazon or e-commerce or something like that, Todd is fantastic as well. But listen, if, you go, if I go out there and I Google buy, an earring, buy earrings, I'm going to come up with millions of different websites. The odds of you being able to generate organic traffic to your Shopify store is pretty much zero in that field of jewelry out there in the world. You're competing against the millions of different jewelers in the world. And so just buying some bulk wholesale earrings, taking pictures of them and creating a Shopify store, that's actually easy, like super easy, right? All you got to do is use a templated theme from Shopify, put your pictures on there, have a company name. You got that. That's easy. The hardest part now is driving traffic to your store and then your store, people wanting to buy those earrings. So when talking with Nancy, uh, you're going to hear really quick, well, what differentiates these earrings from any other earrings that somebody could buy? What's the buying decision when someone's going to buy a piece of jewelry? What goes into that? Why would somebody buy a piece of jewelry from your store when they could go right to the, to the, to the department store down the street and all the different retail jewelry stores and try them on? What's going to make them buy from your store? This is what has gotten a lot of younger people who are prone to what they're seeing on social media about drop shipping and e-commerce stores is go buy something in bulk, stick it on a Shopify store, and boom, you're going to start making money. If it were that easy, Sam, everybody and their mother would be doing it. And listen, I would be doing it. If it were that easy to build a very successful, profitable company, just buying stuff in wholesale, creating a store, and it making lots of money, I would be doing it in addition to AO. It is not that easy. In fact, most people end up 
with a garage full or apartment closet full of six different types of earrings that they were not able to sell. Building a brand, building a company is, is much bigger. If you had said, hey, Sean, I have decided that I want to be the best distributor and retail e-commerce store of women's fashion accessories, specifically earrings, because I am so passionate about women's earrings and I want to help them with that process and bring the most amazing earrings from all over the world and be a differentiating brand that nobody else is doing because I understand women and I understand everything that goes into fashion and everything that goes into what really makes a great earring and why somebody's gonna connect to it and they're gonna connect with my brand because I'm bringing them the best of the best unique and innovative earrings from around the world. That's what my passion is. We might be having a completely different conversation because you'd probably be asking more about building the brand, the logos, the color palette, the story, the vision, the mission, who the ideal client is, what makes you unique as a company instead of, hey, Sean, I want to know how to make money buying some six different types of earrings that don't even tell me. I mean, there's an infinite amount of different types of earrings. And how do I put that on a Shopify store and make some money from it? Do you see the difference? I still think you're thinking short term and small as opposed to thinking about building a real brand and company that you can have for years and years and become the expert in something that people love to be involved with, like, like Tony is doing with Hammett and his fashion handbag line, all right, and, and um, Yemeni's doing, uh, and Nancy's doing. I really think if you could get your, your, um, your experience level up as it relates to all of this kind of arbitrage type of business that it sounds like you really are interested in, let me get you an introduction first to Nancy. Get with Shirley, get an introduction to Nancy if you want to understand a little bit about selling jewelry. The next is, let me get you an introduction to Todd. You might want to go work for somebody first, Sam, since you're trying to learn this business. Let's figure out exactly what kind of business you are 100% sure you want to be involved in. And then why don't I connect you with somebody and see if you can find a way to get a job with them and get educated and learn that business. If you keep going down this route of buying something, hoping to sell it, I promise you, you're gonna lose money just like I did and just like almost everybody does when we approach it that way. We really wanna build something and be expert at it before we just start making those types of investments. But to answer your question, I don't know the answer of, Sean, how do I take the six lines of jewelry, of earrings that I bought. I know you can create the Shopify store, that's easy. Get, get product images, put them up on the store, put product descriptions, price them, figure out the great ways for getting people on an email list. Those things are all easy to do. How to drive traffic to a store in which you're going to sell earrings. The only thing I can think of is Instagram and Facebook advertising, which is really extremely tough in itself. Um, you're going to spend thousands of dollars paying an agency and there's not going to be any profit left over for you. You could try to teach yourself doing it, but if you teach yourself how to do Facebook ads and know how to put together the ad itself, the landing pages, the copy, um, the imagery, build the audiences, target them, you might as well go into the business of doing Facebook ads as a, as a business and do it for other people. You'll make more money. I um, hope this ha helps, Sam. I, I'm really interested in helping find that fine-tuned thing that you're going to sink your teeth into. At this stage, I really think it might be worth it for you to work with somebody who's already successful, and they might be able to share how they're doing it by you working for them and getting some industry experience before you start trying to dive into the shark infested waters of e-commerce. Okay. I hope that helps. All right. Great mentor session. Remember, you're going to get an email with a, your response 
from Honey My Assistant uh, with a direct link to the YouTube video that's good, that we're going to do with this. Hope you got some value from this, um, and I will see you on the next mentor session. I think we've got three coming tomorrow, so lots of great stuff coming. Make sure you get into the portal and ask your questions and look forward to answering them. Okay, have a great day. Peace out.